Bradley has returned? With a vengeance. Yeah. He, destroyed a Briggs tank. he took out a tank. I know, right? Isn't it crazy? You know, I bet a lot of people, a lot of the soldiers, just knowing people probably had a massive fluctuation in thoughts and emotions during this whole experience. I bet a lot of them are switching sides in their mind as the tide shifts, you know? A lot of them probably don't really know where they stand independently of like self-preservation and... Oh no, I sound like homunculus. <laughs> I'm being very cynical. Humans are so predictable. Only caring about their survival. Chew on that, you lousy Briggs traitors. Let's rally the remaining troops. We're gonna retake Central Command. The Fuhrer is at the main gate? So now I know what the bastard who took my granddaughter's arm looks like. Episode 57, Eternal Leave. You sacrifice our country just so you officials can gain immortality and enslave the world as your own? It's even worse than that because they're not going to get anything. The Fuhrer Bradley is also aware of these plans. He was created to lead this country for that purpose. Why shouldn't we do it? We are creating a world without war! And you just have to murder the world first. What? How deluded do you have to be? A world without war? This whole world is war. But really, I mean, to be honest, this is probably not at all about what he's saying anyway. It's not about concern for the world. It's about his wanting to be one of the chosen few and have power. You wouldn't die, you would be reborn. What you of course it would. refer to as reconstruction. We wouldn't be murdering the population like you said. They would be given eternal life while dwelling inside us. Don't you <laughs> see we would bring the world together as one? Yeah, sounds great. All as one, and one as all. Where can I as sign up? As few chosen ones of a mistress, we will bring unity to the entire country. No, no, this is total abuse of this principle. Listen, men, you need to follow orders. That's the only way I can put in a good word for you. Yeah! Oh no, the bathroom slipper. Second only to Winry's wrench in power. I've spent my entire life as a soldier, and it just feels wrong to disobey my superiors. But I don't but, even know yeah. what to believe after hearing all of this. Yeah, that's pretty rough. That was the worst pitch I've ever heard in my entire life. So I'm gonna need you to die, but don't worry, you get to be inside of me. <laughs> no thanks. That's a hard pass for me. Would you like to live inside of me? Forever? <laughs> Ugh. How can you follow a superior you have no faith in? That is not loyalty. That's mindless self-deception. <laughs> Believe in yourselves. And choose life over death. Otherwise, you've led a shameful existence. They make such a good pair, these two. They're perfect together. I think what's really great about that scene, both of them, in different ways, do something that I love, which is connect the actions to valuable principles that can sort of stand the test of time, right? Like, there are so many actions that we take or that we think we need to take, but that's only one part of it. The other part is sort of like, what is it connected to? And even when we don't really articulate that, I think we can feel the difference between action just for action's sake and action for value and principle's sake. So, like, the soldiers are a really good example of action for action's sake, right? It's like, this is just what I gotta do. I'm a soldier, I follow orders. And probably connect to that is like consequence. You know, if I don't follow orders, I'm out of the military or I get punished or I die or something like that. What am I going to do then? I don't know. Contrast that with both Armstrong and Izumi. The value Armstrong is putting forth is loyalty to people who are great, like loyalty to strength, capability, or to whatever it is, but connection for a reason, not blind obedience. Izumi puts forth belief in yourself and extrapolating a little bit from that, you know, maybe honor and following some personal code rather than just being a follower. It's that thing that I think makes so many of the protagonists so great. And even some of the villains, right? Like I was talking about this with Kimberly. I think that's what makes Kimberly great too, is that Kimberly also is connected. Kimberly is no tool, right? Like he knows exactly who he is and he'll follow what his guidelines are. It's just that the results of his actions are terrible. And I think part of what the show is saying is that that is what shapes the world. That kind of thought and that kind of conviction to ideals is the, the shining light in the darkness for humanity. Or at least it's a big part of it. Like there are other things as well. <laughs> this guy. It's amazing how much they conveyed with just like, you know, a couple short sentences. That's their power. Yeah, and these kinds of ideals, they lead to the awakening of certain people. Like we saw this before with uh, the chimeras. Consider this our retirement. You don't want to be inside of me? <laughs> Are you sure? Get out of there if it gets too dangerous. Get out and leave me behind. She's going to take the fall. We get down far enough, I can easily dig us an escape tunnel to the streets. Escape, huh? That's right. I don't mean to sound rude, but you look like you could use a little breather at this point. <laughs> I feel like she would only accept that kind of thing from someone like Izumi. Other people would have gotten killed or stabbed in the hand. Back to this crew. Been a while, feels like. Close. So you can feel it too, huh? 
You mean you can sense his presence or something? Yeah, rancid she. <laughs> well now, I wasn't exactly expecting. Oh, is this the audience. the doctor? You're gonna give me performance anxiety. <laughs> yeah, it is him. You might know me as the man who created King Bradley. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's been very that involved in this whole thing. Proud accomplishment. You created the Fuhrer. In a manner of speaking, yeah. So it's safe to say. <laughs> oh no, here we go again. Working with them. I didn't realize that was you. And here I thought you were at the radio station when in fact you've come here to meet me in person. I can't tell you how much trouble you've saved me, Colonel Mustang. Is he involved somehow in like putting together the sacrifice Boy, stuff? Boys keep them out of my hair for just a few minutes. Oh, these are the other people like Bradley, I'm guessing, right? The men who were gathered at birth, raised by the state, specifically educated. Oh, look at little Bradley. After years of training, they're skilled warriors in their own right. And they've been waiting their whole lives for this kind of opportunity, probably. They may not be as powerful as Bradley himself, but they are strong. I think they nerfed Roy's powers there a little bit. Nice cut. What a stupid time to go passing out. Hang in there. Just don't attack Bradley anymore. You you made your point. Oh, he still got it. I better keep it in or I'll just bleed to death. I mean, he's tough. He's a tough guy. Whoa. <laughs> I love all these like sword sword tricks, sword choreography. Oh damn. It's impressive how quickly you move. You're even older than I am. However, this is as old as you're going to get. Imagine how fast he must have been talking there. <laughs> He's alright. That was not a slash. That was a blunt strike. Speaking of speed, they really backloaded some of the, the best action in the series. It just keeps delivering one episode after another. Well, if it isn't the young prince. Damn it, Ling! Ask me oh, it's Ling. I can't help but recall the last time we fought when I took that girl's arm. It yeah, yeah. That once again, you'd rather risk your own life than give up on something that's not even worth fighting for. Thinking about it now, it's cool how they set this up. Because the Greed-Bradley conflict has built up. Bradley killed the original Greed in the sewers, and also Greed showed up at his house. But separately, and also, Bradley and Ling have set up. They had that the battle that Bradley's referring to where uh, Lan Fan lost her arm. So both of those were set up independently, and they just happened to, you know, both be in Ling's body. Young Lord. Forgive me, my life isn't worth fighting for. Don't give me that crap! And this is the you same conversation that, that they had last time. Like him? Right, about being a king, a king or a leader. Fight for his people. Right, right. Because he is nothing without them. This man is about to sacrifice his own nation. His people. I'll never become the monster that he is. If you are truly a man, it's a battle of ideals. King. <laughs> You must be able to accept some loss. You need to rest, please! Oh no. I don't know if you can rest that off. I mean, he's no buccaneer. You're right, young lord. I need rest. Time for this old man to find rest. Oh no. Part of your shield, Greed, protect the young lord's body! Oh no, is he gonna sacrifice himself? Become the king you're meant to be. But this old servant has no choice but to offer his retirement! <laughs> you stubborn fool! I'm taking you straight to hell with me, Bradley! You bastard! Bradley doesn't look nervous. Oh my god! No. No, you're not gonna let him go out like that. Even while sacrificing myself, I still couldn't lay a single scratch on him. That philosopher's stone might have given you the eyes of a god, but even you can't. <laughs> he keeps the going. Track if you can't see it coming. Whoa. I'll keep you company on the ride down. Whoa, that was genius. 
I was like, there's no way they're gonna hit me like that, right? And let this guy go out without actually helping and dying in vain. Even if that had been the case, I would say that it was still heroic, even if it didn't, you know, have the result he wanted. But it feels so much better that he gave Buccaneer that opening so that his sacrifice actually has value. Buccaneer, man, like, what a guy. What is this, the fifth time he's gotten up despite, you know, having a sword in his abdomen? He just stabbed Bradley with his own sword, right? Which means he took it out, which means he's probably gonna die based on what he said earlier. I like the comparison of the, the leadership ideals between Bradley and Ling. This is a conversation that began a long time ago, right? But I think that we're kind of seeing the fruits of it now. We see that Fu is willing to die for Ling and we see that Buccaneer is willing to die for Armstrong and it's because of what Armstrong was saying, right? Like they have actual real loyalty in someone special. Bradley, on the other hand, is ready to kill all his subjects. And we can see that one by one, the soldiers are turning because there's no real loyalty there. To me, it felt like as soon as he disappeared and Roy started advancing and winning, morale dropped really quickly for the people at Central. I would guess that the motivating factor for most of the soldiers would just be like routine, momentum, and also fear. And it doesn't match the high level of loyalty we see from some of the other characters who actually love and respect their leaders. Thank you. Whoa, did he just get his eye? I guess he's a lot weaker now. This hurts me. Oh no! Fu. Respect. It's sad. I mean, Fu is never a character I felt the most connected to, like, you know, just in the spectrum of characters that I love in this show. But the guy's a hero, and I feel really bad for Lam Fine. I also have a surprising amount of feelings for Buccaneer. I mean, I'm not 100% sure he's dead, although it seems to be implied that he is. I don't know, sometimes you just gotta see the people in action. And then you run into a lamppost. Have you ever even driven a car before? Will you shut up? At least he found his way into Salim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be a lot easier if he was using his fire. But I guess it would be very deadly. Oh, that's got to I mean, speaking of deadly. Tell me, what price was it that you paid? I lost part of my insides. And then after sacrificing part of myself, I learned the truth. Human transmutation. It can't even be performed. You must find this dull. Now we're besties now. Quite the contrary. The homunculi refer to those unfortunate enough to have opened the portal of truth as sacrifices. That could very likely be a clue as to what the enemy has in store. I do have some experience with what you've described. My first encounter with Edward Elric. When a homunculus invaded Fort Briggs, Edward blatantly refused my orders to tell me what he knew about it. At the time, I had not yet been made aware that the enemy had been holding the life of his childhood friend hostage. He just kept repeating, I can't answer that. It was quite clear that any further threat from me would be wasted. In that moment, he was acting neither as a soldier nor as a dog of the military state alchemist. The look in his eyes was desperate. A boy willing to pay any price to protect the things he loved. <laughs> Ed always did have a knack for being stubborn. <laughs> stubborn? I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that's it. Olivier's description of Ed was kind of perfect. A boy willing to pay any price for the things he loves. That's Ed. And that adds to my anxiety a little bit about Ed going into this ending. And I feel like there's a connection there that I'm not getting. Like, I think this conversation is trying to set up the idea of sacrifices. Armstrong was basically saying, this is a clue, right? This is a clue into what to expect. I don't really have a great idea. I mean, I can think of some very technical things, like the fact that there are already pieces of them among the truth. But I feel like this conversation is pointing to it not really being that much of a technical thing and it being more of a thematic thing based on who they are as people and their personality traits and their ideals. And this is me really, really reaching here, but I think maybe these characters are closer to some kind of lived truth, if that makes sense, right? Like they're very pure and refined in their ideals. It's like I was talking about earlier about disconnected action versus like rooted action, real connected personal value. Maybe by having that, they're already closer to the source, if that makes sense. Sometimes I feel like I get close to having deeper understandings about certain things. And these are always very fleeting moments, but my, my sense in those experiences is that there is this undercurrent of truth that is always there. That feeling of something clicking is like a connection, right? It's like, I thought these things were separate 
separate, but actually there's one thing, there's one root concept, for lack of a better word, that connects it. And so I wonder if like this kind of intelligence or this kind of understanding isn't that form of like simplifying over time and getting to actually what the roots are, like the root concepts or the root mechanisms of the universe are. So maybe because these characters are really, really deep already in that, they already in their way are connected to some kind of purity of, of concept. So maybe that is something like truth. And maybe that gives them a closer access to this universal essence or source that I'm guessing will be integral to father's plan for power. I'd be lying if I were to tell you that I wasn't moved when I looked into his eyes. Wow. But still, that doesn't change the fact that he is a naive child. <laughs> I only hope that he can yeah. really lead us out of this fight without his naivete burying us. I mean, there's a real risk, but you can count on Ed to be Ed, at least. I suppose it's about time we got started. <laughs> Starting the sacrifice? Right. In case we make the mistake of thinking that these characters are anti-violence or anti-killing. <laughs> It's not about that. I sometimes forget that the soldiers do not share Ed's values. <laughs> like, they just don't give a crap. They will just kill you. I guess they just don't have Roy using fire because it would be too graphic, maybe. Although, I mean, it's been really graphic. Does it make it better that it was envy and lust that they were homunculi? I don't know. The sacrifice begins. Do you know how many military-operated alchemy laboratories there are here in Central? <laughs> the last I heard, they've only got four labs left in the city. No. The fifth laboratory. We've got five. It's a transmutation circle. The entire city. Right. You mean it's connecting all the laboratories into a circle? Wow. Yeah, everything is a circle. It's just circles upon circles. What's wrong? Are you okay? His animal instincts are kicking in. Yeah. Central City is a circle, just like a mistress is a circle, just like the world is a circle. That's our cue to get the hell out of here. Right, she's supposed to leave, but she's helping Olivier. Then it's time to part ways. <laughs> yeah, she was never leaving. We didn't come all this way to pass up the chance to storm in there and pop some ventricles. You saved our lives. <laughs> Thanks for your help, Azumi Curtis. Don't mention it. Good luck, General Armstrong. Respect. Although I feel like it'll be hard for Azumi to leave. Oh, it's too late. What? Well, it's the whole city. There's no escape, really. Oh my god. Because the whole thing is a circle. There's no... It wouldn't really matter where they were. Oh my god, why? <laughs> These cliffhangers, though. So unsurprisingly, another amazing episode. Although it's sad, I really like the Fu Buccaneer sacrifice beating Bradley. That sequence was great. I love the Izumi Olivier Armstrong connection. They make such a great pair. But I guess the most striking thing about this episode for me, and this is really just my lens, I don't know, like, how deliberate this was on the show's part, is the focus on the things I've been touching on about pure ideals and being realized people in that way. Like we see one by one these characters who are such forces of existence, right? One by one people kind of fold in their paths because we have an instinct for that. We recognize when people are more connected than we are to whatever that thing is, right? Whatever that essence is or that current is. I know that sounds really metaphysical, but I think this is a very non-magical, very real thing. It's just like understanding. And we have an instinct for that that sometimes supersedes even, you know, everyday life concerns. Like, that's why we're able to root for Kimberly, even though he's so terrible, because Kimberly is, in his way, a realized form of that. The people that we're really following closely, they exist in their own world that they've found. Like, they've built that foundation where they're not just victims of chance or circumstance or habit or custom or whatever. They have found these things things that feel right and they're following them to the death and they can't not do that once they found it. That's something I felt for a while about these characters but I feel like this episode really emphasized that and just my hunch is that that thing is connected to the the end game plan for father and maybe even the you know the themes and concepts of the show as a whole in regards to the idea of truth right and why these characters are important why the sacrifices are who they are and maybe even why father will fail but that's just a, a wild guess. Crazy how close we're getting now. I'll see you next time for episode 58.